Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing the study of the book of Acts, and we're going to start with uh, chapter 11, verse 1 today, and see how far we can get in about 90 minutes. Uh, if you did not see the previous studies on Acts, I urge you to watch it from the beginning, uh, especially this book. It, it just, it's such an important book, and I hate to see you just watch one video. We, this is, I think, our 14th or 15th video on this so far, and we're just starting uh, chapter 11, so that gets us about a little more than a third of the way. There's 28 chapters, I remember correctly. So there's a, we're a little more than a third of the way through and with 14 videos. So you can see that uh, it it's taken a long time to get through it all, but um, it's um, already been very revealing. I think all three of us have, uh, have had some, uh, gained some new knowledge and understanding from this study. Before we get started, though, let me ask uh, Brother Ted and Brother Joe to uh, say hi. Uh, this is uh, Joe from the Sebastian Dresden channel, a uh, channel for fellowship and learning, and uh, looking forward to the study today. Uh, sub, if you feel so inclined, <laughs> back to you. All right, Brother Ted. Thanks. This is Ted from God's Truth Ministries channel, and uh, hope you guys can drop by over there on that channel. Some few videos for... Uh, giving out the gospel of the Lord Jesus and edifying the saints. And I hope you guys will stick with us through Acts. We're getting into some great stuff here. So glad you're here. Thanks. Jeez. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I pressed my buttons the exact opposite. I wanted to mute my mic. Instead, it was on. And then after you were finished, I muted it. It's like my mind is not 100% right now. But... Uh, and Joe's going to say, well, that's... that's You're that's back normal. to normal, Luke. You're that's back to normal. <laughs> that's normal. I knew you couldn't miss that opportunity. <laughs> um, well, let me ask. Uh, uh, one of you volunteered to uh, give a, um, a like a 30-second uh, summary of where we left off. Let it be, Ted. Wow, at first I thought he said, let me, Ted, and then I realized, oh, he said, let it be, Ted. Oh, I, sh I should have known. Well, thanks for that, brother. Uh, the, uh, the rookies will get the hazing, I guess, here. Well, uh, we left off with uh, one of the great turning points, I believe, in, in church history, where the, the Gentiles are, are truly uh, included. Uh, it's, it's evident to the apostles now to the great uh, St. Peter, great great Apostle Peter, uh, he had a vision, and he said, uh, you guys can go back and visit it, we're going to see it in today, where he had a vision where God, in summary, told him not to call anything or any man common or unclean. He goes to the Gentiles, they get saved, they get saved before baptism, before laying on of hands, they get forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, they speak with tongues, uh, and uh, it's evident uh, that the Gentiles are on equal footing in Christ. And uh, this is a blessing and a turning point in history, and we're going to see what happens now when he goes back to Judea with this. So uh, back to you, brother. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, so now picking up with chapter 11, verse 1, first in the KJV, uh, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem, uh, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, <clears throat> Well, first let me, before we get his recount of, of all this, just your first your reaction to the first three verses, and... Uh, I think we should have uh, uh, brother uh, brother Joe go first, because but if we let Ted go first, th there's nothing left to be said. That that's so true, Luke. But I, I, I'll go first only because it's my turn. Uh, if I'm if I'm keeping track right here, uh, 
By the way, if you haven't, I just uh, ventured over to Ted's channel. You know, Ted, you have a gift. I mean, you have you, you're one of those guys that you would expect to be in front of a, a mega church. You've got that uh, natural clarity and uh, and a, just an awesome way of uh, bringing light and and uh, doing it in a real not I don't want to say professional, but uh, in a real unexpected manner. I mean, you should be pastoring a church somewhere. You're, you're very gifted at bringing clarity to what you're saying, and, and the way you say it is just really impressive. I can't believe I haven't been over there uh, yet. So uh, that's why I always like Ted to go first. It, it takes all the pressure off me. But anyway, oh, what we have here? <laughs> but oh, you are you are a good, you would be a good pastor. You're already hitting on the tithing. It's great. Pass the plate. <clears throat> but uh, here in chapter 11, it, it says that Peter rehearsed what he was going to say. You know, he knew what was coming. Uh, he just he just broke every Jewish custom and tradition and rabbinical law that they had still kept after accepting Christ. Uh, they had still kept to themselves. They had still kept to, uh, uh, you know, Israel. Is, uh, the Jews being the, the true church, the true body, and now the true body of Christ. So he's going to have a lot of explaining to do because uh, there are those, and I and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but James was a bit of a tool uh, in this area. I, I think he's the leader at this point of the church in Jerusalem, and he's anything but charitable towards uh, breaking with Jewish custom and tradition. And so I think Peter's pretty uptight. I mean, if he's rehearsing the matter from the beginning and then expounding in order to get them to not tear him to pieces, uh, he's got to keep peace. Now, this is the body of Christ. He's not talking to the Jews. He's not talking in the synagogue. He's talking to his brothers who he loves. And, and, uh, and these people have spent years together loving each other in a way that the world has never seen before true body of Christ love and yet the same guys are coming out you know at least a, a portion of them if not the majority to rip Peter a new one for for uh, uh, doing what they think is unseemly uh, and so I wouldn't want to be in Peter's shoes uh, he'd better have uh, have this rehearsed like it says pretty good uh, over to you Ted Well, this time I think you said it all, brother. I mean, there's 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 not much to say other than what the text says. I I, I do think we need to point out here that uh, that it wasn't specifically or solely uh, James. It doesn't even say specifically that it was James being uh, the one who specifically contended with Peter, but it just says they in verse two. They that were of the circumcision contended with him, and. Uh, the main thing that they were concerned with is is their their accusation in verse three. This was the main issue. Thou went in to men uncircumcised and eat and did eat with them. Apparently, uh, I don't know if there's you know anything in Leviticus. Excuse my Old Testament ignorance, but I don't know if there's anything in Leviticus or in Deuteronomy uh, reiterated uh, at all uh, or 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 put there at all in the in the Levitical law. Mosaical law that says uh, specifically you're not to you know consume food around a Gentile, especially in their household. It probably does. That shows my Old Testament ignorance right there. But maybe this was more of a traditional thing. Uh, so uh, Luke, I mean, you're more of a scholar of Old Testament. Uh, just taking these first three or four verses. What's what's your thoughts on that? Back to you. That's all I have. Well. The reason I wanted to stop here, rather than going on to his um, uh, gi giving an account of what happened with Cornelius, uh, is because we we did get a, a little bit of a uh, inkling of this problem in chapter ten, when it did it did also say that that uh, Peter it was talking about Peter go having these people come into their house and actually stay in their house and. Uh, and then he went with them the next day to, to, to Cornelius's house. But all of this was, is even mentioned in chapter 10 that this was not normal. 
uh, that, that they, they, it, the normal thing is there's segregation. And, and the, the Jews do not associate with Gentiles, period. Uh, and it's a very, very strict. It's, it's an it's a institutionalized segregation. And not only that, it, it even raised to the level of, uh, um, uh, you know, I don't, want, I don't know if I can say hatred, but they, they was just really, just really, they thought very little, lowly of the Gentiles. Um, so you wouldn't be caught dead associating with one, and the last thing you'd ever do is you would never go into their home and, and, and uh, share a meal with them or invite them into your home. So this was institutionalized, and uh, whether we, we get it in the Old Testament, that we discussed last time, Brother Joe uh, made us think about that, and uh, we, we weren't really sure if this was Old Testament or if it was from beyond the Old Testament, between the Old Testament and uh, the, the current time there, you have uh, all this period where rabbis were writing and uh, making rules. And this, this is what Jesus called the traditions of men. Rather than following the scriptures, the rabbis came up with all kinds of new rules and regulations, these tra and they became traditions. And they became very rigid, like more laws. And so we, I, I think we, we all suspect that that's probably how this segregation and this, this attitude towards the, the Gentiles uh, came about. Because the only thing in the, in the Old Testament we know that they were not supposed to intermarry because uh, if, if the Jews intermarried with uh, the Gentile world, um, it would, they would bring in their pagan religions and it would adulterate. Judaism. That's what the fear was. <clears throat> so to protect from that, there was no intermarriage. And uh, so now we're seeing this, ex this first reaction. Now I've, I've talked about this throughout the whole study of Acts. I keep bringing it up over and over and over again, what we're getting into right now. And now we get a real good indication of the attitude. It said, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God, and so they they heard about it. Now, Peter hasn't told them, but word has gotten back to them somehow. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. So it was contentious, saying, Thou, and that's the reason I use my uh, uh, thespian, not lesbian, my thespian skills here. Uh, and, and tried to act this out for you. Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. That's the attitude that, that they gave Peter. Um, and it's because it was forbidden. And they were shocked and they were reprimanding him. Uh, how dare you do such a thing? Uh, so that's where we're at. And uh, I've said in the introduction to the book of Acts, if you go to the very first video in this series, um, when I kind of introduced the book and gave kind of a summary of what the book's all about, I said that there's two problems in the, in the beginning of the church that have to be corrected. And that's why many people call the book of Acts a transitional book, because it shows that the transition the church went through. Uh, in the beginning, they never considered that Gentiles were going to be included. They despised Gentiles. They, they wouldn't associate with them, and they're certainly not going to be part of this new uh, faith that they have. And then the other thing was they, they were uh, very religious, and this practicing this Judaism religiously, they never dreamed that they would be, ever be expected to give it up and leave it behind. But these are the two things that the church must do in this transitional period, and it's not easy. There's a lot of strife in the beginning of the church here, and this is the beginning that you see of it. Uh, all right, before I read further, any more comments on that? Yeah, one thing, though, I, I, I did want to, I went to a lot of trouble here to bring up uh, my Google effects for your oratory uh, narration there. It, Max McLean couldn't have done any better. Uh, 
I, I did some research after yesterday's show. Uh, I've got a huge stack of dusty books called the Matthew Henry Commentaries. It's online also, though. Anyone can look it up there, uh, I think, through Bible Gateway. Uh, but uh, in looking through the dusty book, uh, evidently uh, it was largely rabbinical law rather than God's law that separated uh, the Jewish from the uh, heathen nations insofar as uh, generosity, uh, showing light, uh, sharing wisdom, all of that was ceased because of rabbinical law, not not uh, not uh, not Levitical or godly law. And so uh, I, I was right, it, a, a good portion of it. And David, being a type of Christ, often went to the Gentile nations to show kindness and to receive kindness. And, uh, and so that was a, a way that uh, Matthew Henry had, had kind of compared uh, David to being a type of Christ. And so they're out of line here. And uh, uh, as far as eating with them, uh, I don't know if that was rabbinical or Levitical. I'm not sure. I didn't study a bit more than three minutes. I just wanted to look up and see if that one point was correct. But, uh, you know, if, if they're going to take this attitude, uh, every new convert uh, better be prepared to, you know, get circumcised in addition to all the other stuff they'd have to follow. And uh, as we noted earlier, Peter way back in the first chapter, second chapter, uh, said that, you know, this was going to happen, but I guess he didn't hear what he was saying. I, I keep saying that, I think three times now, but I, I do believe that's the case. And he's surprised by his own actions as to what happened, and through, only through the grace and revelation of God uh, was he able to, to break with tradition. And so uh, these other people are getting the second-hand revelation. So it's not going to be the same kind of uh, uh, acceptance as we'll come to see, I think. Back to you. All right. Uh, but based upon his time with Cornelius in the visions, uh, we, we see two things. Uh, God has corrected them and, and said, said, set this aside. The dietary laws don't apply. No food's unclean. In addition to that, no man is unclean. So uh, now these two things that they, uh, the, the dietary law is part of all of Judaism, but there's so much more to it, including circumcision, temple worship, animal sacrifices, and, and more. But so the dietary law is the first thing God says, this doesn't apply. And there's nothing unclean anymore, and don't consider Gentiles unclean anymore. So this is established. Peter is aware of this, but the rest of the, <laughs> the church in Jerusalem, they're not aware of all this yet. And as they learn about all this, uh, there is great strife and division. Now, someone mentioned James, and I mentioned James numerous times, but um, I, when I did the study on... Uh, Early church history. Uh, uh, the uh, it, historians would normally would they actually would say that James held what they called the bishopric in Jerusalem. He was the the bishop of Jerusalem, the leader of the church <coughs> in Jerusalem. And of course, at this time, there was no other church. <laughs> it's only Jerusalem. So he's the leader of the church. Um, it seems like Peter would be, but James instead holds the position, maybe because he was the brother of the Lord, and maybe they felt through some kind of uh, you know uh, family inheritance that James must have inherited the position because he was the brother. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to why, uh, but he's also called James the Just. There's a lot to be said about about that. So I, I recommend you watch my playlist, uh, early church history. And I go into great detail on all of this, but uh, so we mentioned James, but you can see that James isn't even mentioned at this point. This is the reaction of just everybody, the apostles and the brethren, it says. And, and that's just a normal reaction from any Jewish believer at this point. They're in shock of what Peter has done. All right, let me go further. Oh, I'm going to read those verses in the Amplified just to see if there's anything interesting in there. It says, now the apostles and the believers who were throughout Judea heard with astonishment that the Gentiles also had received and accepted the word of God, the message concerning salvation through Christ. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, 
those of the circumcision, uh, certain Jewish believers who followed the law, took issue with him for violating Jewish customs. Um, you went to uncircumcised men and even ate with them. So now we're at verse 4. So I'll read, start with verse 4 now in the KJV. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance, and I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me, upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth, but, but the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not, not thou un, that call not thou common. Uh, and this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Uh, moreover, the six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Uh, I'll stop there after verse 12. There's, there's a lot of uh, verses we've already read, so let me get your thoughts on all that. Well, he's, uh, he's certainly uh, making his, his uh, vision and, and the fact that it was from God known. Uh, he took six guys with him. I, I didn't see that before. I knew he took, I thought, one or two, but six. Uh, and and uh, the word customs uh, is there other than, rather than the word laws. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not only that he's letting them know that it's okay to be with the, the Gentiles who engage in this unsanctioned way of life, but he's also telling them that God's saying, you can now eat like the Gentiles. And furthermore, uh, I believe it was a command to do so. Uh, so that's got to be a, another kink in the rope uh, that, that Peter's going to have to uh, use. And so uh, he's not just saying, you know, it's open. they're not go him. Is that what they call the Gentiles? Uh, they're not just unclean or common. Uh, we may now eat what they eat uh, and and put our Levitical or whatever dietary restrictions in the ash bin of history. That's That's got to be a hard pill to swallow for these guys because food's a big deal uh, with God and man. I mean, it, it's a big deal. And so... Uh, culture shock you know this is uh this isn't just a clash of cultures this is a, a defeat of the mosaic tradition so uh this is a hurdle it's got to be a hurdle back over to uh you Ted. well if anybody hadn't watched yesterday's go back and, and check that out the, the the recounting here of of, of the vision and what followed is, is covered in, in chapter 10. Peter's just recounting uh, the vision, and, and I agree with Joe. I, I would think this is a command from, from the angel uh, of the Lord sent to, to Peter this, in this vision. And uh, it's a command not to call anything uncommon anymore, uh, especially man, any man. And uh, it was a command to go, and to go into Cornelius' house. So uh, he, Peter was following God's will. And uh, it's just a recounting of what what happened previously, and uh, I think it's <laughs> interesting in verse 12 there. Uh, and the Spirit bade me go. Uh, uh, I don't know, we, could, uh, we could probably read that in another version. Uh, uh, verse 12, uh, the Spirit told me. Yeah, the Spirit told me to go. So this was a command, absolutely, brother. And uh, with them, nothing doubting. Basically, the Spirit saying, "Go and don't doubt." So. 
And I think it's interesting in verse 12, he says, Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. Peter says, look, listen, I'm, I'm not in this alone. Uh, these six brethren not only went with me, but we went into, entered into the man's house. So, and these guys are witnesses to what happened, and he's going he's gonna to tell us in the upcoming verses what happened. Thanks, brother. Um, well, Brother Joe, you, you said that it mentioned um, custom uh, ra rather than law. And if, let me see if I can find the verse. Uh, uh, where does it say custom? If you, if you know what verse it is, tell me here. Uh, I may have been having an auditory hallucination, but I thought I heard it. Uh, I'll reread here. Well, if, if it says custom, it might have been in the Amplified where I read it earlier. Uh, uh, that, that's probably what it was, Luke, because I don't see it either. Oh, yeah, and it's in the Amplified. It said, it, it said took with him for violating Jewish customs. Um, so the Amplified is, is interpreting it uh, in the same way that, that we think it should be, is that it wasn't the law uh, that God gave that forbid them to associate or even eat with a Gentile, but it was uh, part of the Jewish custom that, that, that we referenced that uh, over a long period of time, all the rabbis established more customs, and Jesus really objected to it. He, he, he condemned it. Instead of, instead of instead of believing in the the word of God, you're you're believing in the traditions of men. Uh, so much like Roman Catholicism again, you know, they over all these centuries of Roman Catholic uh, Church history, they've built up all of these customs given down through the popes, all these dictates, and and uh, uh, and they uh, uh, rather than just believing in the Bible, that now. Roman Catholicism, they really put their faith in the customs that, and the, the traditions of Romanism. So I, you know, there's an awful lot of similarity between Romanism and, and uh, what we see in the beginning here is uh, very a lot of religion and then you add Jesus to it. But the fact is there you're not supposed to have any faith in religion. If a person wants to be religious, if they want rituals and ceremonies, it's not forbidden. Unless you're putting your faith in that, rather than Jesus, that's where the pr the, the problem comes from. Um, all right, let me start with the verse uh, thirteen now. Oh, could I could I could I interject? Luke? Yeah, exactly. yeah uh, just one interjection before we pass it by, because we won't get back to it. It just occurred to me, you know, Christ never broke uh, God's law or never broke God's commandments because he was sinless. And anything that God had given as a law, Christ would never uh, counter. He came to fulfill it, not to break it. And uh, yet, on the Sabbath, he helped uh, a donkey out of a ditch or something. Or I forget what it was, carried something too far. And uh, he was accused of breaking the law. And Christ just kind of poo-pooed it. Uh, you guys, you know, you're, you're missing the point of the law. Well... Again, we're back to the customs. Christ was breaking what they saw as law, but it wasn't actually God's law. It was rabbinical custom or rabbinical law, and Christ paid no attention to that. And that's all I wanted to throw in. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, let me just correct the, the donkey quick, uh, point you made there. That uh, uh, that was Jesus um, criticizing uh, the, the religious leaders uh, they're, they're saying, you're breaking the Sabbath by doing these miracles and healing people. And he said, well, who among you would not take your animal out of a ditch on the Sabbath to, to help to get them out? Um, Jesus didn't do that. He was just used that as an example saying, look, this is, don't be ridiculous. Even you would pull your donkey out of a ditch. You know. Uh, all right, let me go. We will continue here. Uh, verse 13. Uh, no. And, and he showed us, uh, no, I'm verse 12, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, the six brethren 
well, let me say the six. Uh, we are talking about one or two brethren last time, but those were the, the, the people that were sent from Cornelius to retrieve uh, Paul. There were two of them. I mean, not Paul, Peter. Um, but the, the, the party that went with Peter to, to, to uh, go to uh, Cornelius' house, it was Peter, and then he was accompanied by six brethren. Uh, and we entered into the man's house, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and thy all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then I re then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the one, this is where I keep on harping on. What did they do? They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound familiar to anybody? This is the verse we all like to quote, Acts 16.31. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This was Paul speaking to the Philippian jailer. And yet we see much earlier here, Peter using that term to say that Cornelius and his family and friends, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, like, like we did, and they received the same gift as us. Uh, uh, what was I that I could withstand God? Let's stop there, verse 17. Well, he's, he's, uh, he's like kind of trying to cover his, his backside, you know. Uh, listen, it wasn't me, it was God, you know. He, he's trying to make sure that they understand this was not his idea. <laughs> you know, uh, he's in agreement with it, but he didn't come up with it. This was this was God's doing. You got a problem with it? You got to take it up with Him. And uh, I think it's also uh, going to be amazing the people that he's speaking with that God would have sent an angel to a Gentile, uh, compelling him to to bring Peter there. Um, so those are the only two things that jump out at me. Okay, Brother Ted? Well, yeah, I think that uh, Joe's right on. He, he brought to mind my mind that uh, what this is is more like just Peter's defense of himself, and it was a legitimate defense. I mean, uh, uh, Peter saying the whole time, listen, this is what the Spirit said. This is what the vision said. And I'm, uh, you know, like another place where Paul says, you know, to, I think, uh, King Agrippa, uh, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. <laughs> this, this is, that was Paul's defense. This is Peter's defense. You know, of course, this happened earlier. And, um, you know, Peter's just saying, listen, this is, this is from the Lord. I was commanded and I obeyed. Would you guys rather have me disobey and not be, be obedient to what I was told? And, uh, I like verse 14, uh, where he's recounting uh, the story of what uh, you know Cornelius said to him, Who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and thy house shall be saved? So this is the message of salvation, just like you said, Brother uh, Luke. It's, uh, it's the message of Peter. Uh, these, uh, Cornelius and his household are expecting the words of salvation, how to be saved, what it means. Whatever that is, this guy Peter is going to tell you. And uh, Cornelius says, you know, give us the words. Give us the message of salvation. Tell us what you have from God. Uh, it says in verse 15, I began to speak. The Holy Ghost did fall on them, as on us at the beginning. He re reiterates that. It was in chapter 10. And uh, it's interesting how he remembered uh, the word of the Lord, verse 16. John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And uh, that's just, wow. It, it, Peter's saying, listen, this is, guys, listen, this is a fulfillment of what the Lord himself promised. And uh, this is what came to my mind, guys, when this happened to these Gentiles. So obviously, P Peter was identifying it with truth stated by the Lord, promises of the Lord, that very promise of the Holy Ghost. Uh, For as much then as God gave them the like gift, 
as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I? You know, who was I? How dare I withstand God? He's saying, listen, this vision's from God, this command's from God, I was obedient to God, and who was I to withstand God? So you guys have any answer for that? He's putting back on them. He just throws it back on them. So I think Peter did completely right here. Back to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, the, the reason that I emphasize this terminology, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and, um, is, is be, because uh, it, it uh, where, else, where else did I, I've heard that before. Where else did I hear that? Oh, that's what Paul said. Uh, and, and Peter used the exact words as Paul, except Paul's Peter is saying it before Paul. Um, and again, I, I've mentioned this so many times. That maybe, maybe people. Uh, and I said last time the reason I keep harping on this is because I feel like I am called to def defend Jesus, Peter, and John as uh, their their message of salvation as valid too, not only Paul's. I need to correct the Paul only -ness. I don't know. There's only one other guy. I can't remember his name right now. There's only one other guy on YouTube I've encountered that has actually come out again and really not just said, okay, Paul only is wrong. Oh, Brother Ted says that. Uh, Brother Joe agrees too. But, but I've made an entire series, probably six, eight, ten hours of content to refute this Paul onlyism, and there's this other fellow. He's he's done a lot of work on this too. But other than that, nobody is addressing this false teaching, and so I feel a real responsibility to always make this point. Uh, Brother Ted, you said you said this is the message of salvation. So uh, where did you get that from? Uh, it said uh, in verse fourteen. Um, who who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? These are the words of, about how to be saved. This is the message of salvation. This is the gospel. Now the Paul only is saying, oh, it's a different message. It's not the same message as, as Paul. Paul preached death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, if you look at the content of Peter's message at the very first day of Pentecost, three more times after it, and now finally here to here into um, Cornelius and his family, the content of the sermon is the death, burial, and resurrection and the remission of sins because of faith in Jesus. Isn't that Paul's message? It's the same. So these people that want to say that Jesus, John, and Peter didn't teach the same message, you can only get saved from Paul's words. It angers me because, and, you know, you can get saved by reading uh, the red letters. Those are the, the words spoken by Jesus. You get saved by the, the writing of John's letter, uh, 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 gospel. You get saved by listening to Peter as Cornelius did and, and all these did. It's the same message. He told Cornelius about the death, burial, and resurrection and the remission of sins through faith in Jesus. Now tell me, how is that any different? than the message we believe in now and that, that Paul taught too. So, um, now, the, the other thing, um, uh, you, you, someone said that he's, he's kind of uh, defending himself. <laughs> yeah, he's defending himself because he's under attack. Basically, uh, he's probably concerned that they're going to consider him a heretic. And this is such a serious infraction, associating with Gentiles, and yet, not only that, you ate with them? Heresy! So, um, that's why he has to say, this is from God. Now, he says, who am I? How does it phrase there? Uh, I keep on losing my place. What was I, that I could withstand God? And that reminds me, of every time Peter and John were arrested. He preaches, the Sanhedrin arrest him, they tell him, don't preach in that name anymore, and he says, should we obey men 
or should we obey God? It's the same same uh, point that he's making there. Um, all right, before I go on anymore. Well, I, I would add that, uh, number one, uh, I am just taken aback by how many Paul only are in my circles. You know, half my friends are not Christians on here uh, that I associate with. Uh, the heathens, <laughs> the common people, and uh, and and the other half seem to be almost exclusively either Paul only or, or heavily, heavily in that direction, and uh, so much light is snuffed out with that uh, theology or that doctrine because uh, Romans through Philemon uh, says, well, Acts not Acts is not for us. Revelations is not for us. The the gospels are not for us. You know what what loss of light these people have because they only focus at Romans through Philemon for us. And the other thing I wanted to note is that Peter, unlike so many, is not making a proclamation of the truth. He's doing an explanation. You know. He's not proclaiming anything as much as he's explaining everything. And I think that's another indication that we've moved from the law to, unto this new uh, age of grace and, and, and how we communicate uh, God's will. Uh, I think uh, we do well uh, to follow his example. Here's something else that Paul only has will miss. We, we would do well to do a lot more explaining and a lot less proclaiming, I think, sometimes uh, to people for so that they can understand and be receptive in this age of grace. Just a, a personal thought. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I can all, it's almost like Peter's on trial right here. He having to defend what he's done. He's a, they're really uh, outraged, they're shocked. And so he's almost like defending himself like he's uh, against uh, some kind of charge. Obviously, uh, and you see he was, he was taken by the Sanhedrin, or as I said, arrested, and, and had to defend himself to them. And now <laughs> he's he's under the same kind of a situation where he has to defend himself uh, against the, the the apostles and the brethren in in uh, Judea. This is Judea, I think. It doesn't say Jerusalem yet, right? Let me see the first one. Uh, and the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea. So uh, and oh, and when Peter was come to up to Jerusalem, okay, so it's in Jerusalem. That's verse two. All right, we haven't heard James' name mentioned yet, but that should be coming up. All right, let's read further. Uh, uh, verse eighteen. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorify God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Wow. Let's just stop on that one verse there. Go ahead. Well, that's amazing. Uh, well, that, that verse holds a lot of weight in, in my spirit, if, if not to sound corny, but uh, it does. It just uh, it has led uh, in it. It just... You can feel the uh, the significance of that verse, uh, and and let's clarify: repentance meaning to know God, to to change from uh, not knowing God to know God, to to see that His ways can be our ways. We accept Him. So, yeah, that that has a lot of weight to it. Yeah, I think uh, it's probably good that you stuck with this one verse, Luke, because um, you talk about hitting on errors and how you have to, you know, when you come through these verses, you you know, you like to hit the uh, the Paul only uh, uh, you know, ex extremists that, uh, that those extremes that lead to over dividing, or, or I forget how you termed it the other day, but I thought that was fitting. Uh, instead of rightly dividing, people over divide. Uh, you know, I do like the fact, on, the, on a positive note, I do like the fact that when these brethren in Jerusalem there, when they heard Peter's excla excla exclamation, uh, explanation, 
they didn't argue at all after that. They knew this guy was, you know, Peter was telling them the truth. They knew he was straight with them, and uh, <clears throat> they didn't they didn't contend with him any further. That's a good thing, and uh, they just received it as, hey, Peter's word is as good as gold. If he says he got this vision. The six witnesses are here with him, and not that he needed them, but uh, they said, okay. In fact, they rejoiced. They held their peace, and they praised God. They glorified God, saying, then hath God also uh, to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now, this is the error that I want to hit uh, that some people, and uh, it's a, uh, you talk about uh, cultic tendencies, uh, Calvinism would take this verse and say, well, you see, right there, there's some Gentiles that God must have chosen uh, before I, before eternity to be saved. And it was only those in Cornelius' house that day. That's the only guys he wanted saved. And, uh, you know, he's got his uh, select few. And as one famous lordship Cal Calvinist preacher uh, once said, the only people who are the saved are uh, those of us, you know, those few of us, out of uh, the myriads cascading into hell. That's how he termed it. He chose us out of the myriads of people cascading into hell. Doesn't that just sound like uh, the loving God you and I know? Not. Uh, what it simply means is when they held their peace and they glorified God, they're just saying, God's letting the Gentiles in on this as a group. Not Cornelius' household, but Gentiles as a whole. They're included. They're part of this. God's granted them uh, the ability to be part of salvation, of changing their mind that results in life. Repentance unto life. So it's, uh, once again, boy, don't, don't get me started on, on those kind of errors, but uh, they will take that kind of verse and make it into something that it's not. Back to you, brother. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well. Oh, oh. I don't know why I keep on losing my place every time. This. So, uh, okay, that was verse eighteen. The the thing that's amazing to me is there was such shock and and. Um, disapproval of um, Peter and when he arrives and then when he get, explains it to them instantly their mind is changed and they accept what he said that this is what God wants and they, there's no resistance I wish I could say that at Acts chapter 11 verse 17 that this strife over these issues uh, ends right here. That uh, good, it's settled. <laughs> but as we go along, we're going to see this continues for a long time, and it, it's not over by a long shot. But at least this group of people that Peter's talking to here, they understand and they are agreeing. This is a wonderful thing. The Gentiles are going to be. We're all this, the same. Um, now, verse 19, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Um, and, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Let me read verse 20 in the Amplified real quick for, for us here. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, proclaiming to them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So okay, well let me uh, let me stop there and get your thoughts on that. Well, uh, first thing that, that I see is it looks like uh, pre Paul that they were reaching out to the Grecians. Uh, it says they they were uh, I kind of lost track here in my mind, but it sounds like they were at first just uh, uh, talking to the Jews, 
but now there's an outreach to uh, to the uh, Gentiles, or am I misunderstanding that? Uh, I, I'll interject there. My New King James says Hellenists, so I'm guessing that these these Grecians are like in an earlier chapter where it says Grecians and the, and the New King James says Hellenists. Maybe that's a little more specific that these were uh, these were Jews that spoke Greek, uh, but still Jews, still observant Jews as well. So that's that's what I'm seeing. Thanks, thanks, Ted. I I wasn't sure at all on that. I'm just going to go ahead and pass it uh, over to you, Ted. Well, I, I think the uh, the text says it all. I mean, and these these aren't the, the Jews that were uh, you know that were here at this uh, get together in Jerusalem <laughs> where Peter testified about what happened with the Gentiles. These were Jews uh, that were scattered abroad because of the persecution of Stephen. These were still Jews that just went, I am out of town. I'm getting out of here, and uh, they uh, preached to the Jews only. Uh, uh, you know, to these other regions as far as uh, Phoenice uh, and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but Jews only. So they were, they were, they were still, they were, they were following the marching orders of the day, the Jew first. And some of the men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So they were still. Uh, following the orders, they weren't just because they were scattered and persecuted at Jerusalem. They didn't stop preaching, but they were. It's my understanding they're following the marching orders, going to the Jew first, and probably that included uh, primarily uh, preaching Christ at the synagogues. We're not told right there what kind of trouble that stirred up. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all right, I, I think it'll be helpful to read these three verses here, uh, 1920. 21 in the Amplified as a whole here. I only read verse 20, but <clears throat> it says, well, first of all, it says in the KJV, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none, but unto the Jews only. So <clears throat> we that's pretty clear. What is a little confusing is verse uh, 20 of uh, these Grecians, were they, were they Gentiles? But the, according to the, the Amplified, the way that they, they're interpreting this, it says, so then, since they, this is starting with verse 19, <clears throat> so then, since they were unaware of these developments, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with the stoning of Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch without telling the message of salvation through Christ to anyone except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, proclaiming to them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the hand and power and presence of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord for salvation, accepting and drawing near to Jesus as Messiah and Savior. So that's true. So what I'm getting from the Amplified is that this verse 20 says that there were some of them that began speaking to the Greeks, and it seems like they're seeing that as not uh, Greek proselytes, Hellenized Jews, but but uh, Gentiles. Uh, so it may be correct, uh, Brother Joe's uh, assumption that oh, so they're they're bef before Paul gets his goes off on his uh, all his work to uh, preach to the Gentiles. Then this has already happened. Peter and now some others are doing it too prior to, to Paul. I think that is probably the case if the Amplified has verse 20 right, but I'm not so sure about that. Before I go any further, anything else? Yeah, Luke, I, I went ahead because this just spiked my curiosity, and I went, went ahead and went to Young's literal translation of verse 20, and it says, And there were certain of them men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who having entered into Antioch were speaking unto the Hellenists, proclaiming good news, the Lord Jesus. So I guess it, the, the literal translation of Grecians or uh, of that word there is Hellenists, the literal translation. I guess the burden of 
is on us to find out what Hellenist actually means. Did that include some Gentiles? We know it from what you guys have said. It means Greek-speaking Jews. But does it include Gentiles also? I, I don't know. But Hellenist is the literal translation of that word. So that's all I know. Well, uh, not, not from Scripture but from uh, my study of early church history, when I did all that study, the, the, the term Hellenized Jew um, or the Hellenists, th this was the, as a matter of fact, it might, might have been in a Peter sermon, if we go, go to Acts chapter 2 again, look after Peter's sermon, it might have had the term Hellenized there too. It said proselytes, maybe it did say Hellenized, but the Hellenized means that these are Jews that lived abroad, that they spoke Greek rather than than uh, than uh, uh, Hebrew or Aramaic. So uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, they're not preaching to Gentiles. They may be, but I'm pretty sure they're not. And so far, it just seems that Peter's the, the first and only one at this point. I'm that's the way I, I see it, but I may be wrong. Okay, let me go on unless you want anybody wants to say more about that. Okay, verse uh, verse 21, I know verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church was, which was in Jerusalem. So this is, seems to be saying that contrary to verse 2, it says, and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, uh, see, first he says in verse 1, it says, uh, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And Peter was come up to Jerusalem, but is, he's come up to Jerusalem, but maybe he's not in Jerusalem. Because it seems to be saying now in verse uh, 22, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. So this is an outside of Jerusalem that they're aware of this, uh, that, that Peter had this. Um, uh, it, it did his defense, his explanation, and they're all happy about it. But actually the church in Jerusalem is what we're going to now. So verse 22, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all with... The, uh, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Um, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and, and of faith, and much people had added unto the Lord. Uh, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Uh, okay, let me stop there. Well, this is uh, this is Barnabas, and we, we remember that... Uh, uh, he's the one that uh, uh, authenticated or uh, had Paul's bag, Saul's bag, uh, in his intro initial introduction to the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, it's no surprise that uh, he, being full of the Spirit, saw the things of God as the things of God. Uh, I, I don't know how this is going to turn. Uh, when Peter walks into uh, Jerusalem, though, I, I forget how it goes. I will say that Peter carries a lot of weight, uh, and, and uh, you know, he is the most noted of the apostles, and even in his time, I think. And so, uh, you know, whenever Paul said something, what do they do? Uh, churches and, and people went to Peter and, and the other apostles to verify what Paul was saying. So what Peter says carries a lot of weight. So I'm just curious how this is going to uh, maybe uh, hit the fan a little bit when he gets to uh, the more structured uh, uh, among them. Back to you. Well, I'll go ahead and take this here. Um, I do think it's interesting that verse 21, where it says the hand of the Lord is with them, it's talking about those who preach to the uh, the ones who were scattered, the Jews and the Hellenists there, uh, it says a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. That's that's significant in my mind in the fact that uh, a great number of the common 
the common people, the common Jews in all those regions, Cyprus, Antioch, and what have you, uh, Phoenicia, uh, they, they, a great number of them turned to the Lord. That sounds like a majority of just regular common day uh, religious Jews that were, that were observant, synagogue-going Jews. They turned and believed on Christ, but you know, we, we see no indication at all, and we're going to see it throughout Acts, that the religious leaders uh, didn't, in great number, hardly at all, did any of them turn to the Lord. So the Pharisees didn't, just like in Jesus' uh, time earlier with them. The religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth, didn't turn to the Lord. But a great number of, of Jews, just common folk, did. And that's what's sad. And what they did was... Uh, because there was many believers, I think, when they heard about that in Jerusalem, they, they're going to, they said they're going to send uh, Barnabas. And uh, Barnabas being the encourager and the exhorter. Uh, when, I, when I heard you read this passage, Luke, it kind of to me like the sending of Barnabas is kind of like, uh, you know, you have an evangelist that comes to town, you know, and uh, let's say it, it's an evangelist that preaches, you know, a true gospel message, and a lot of people get genuinely saved. And then, uh, so they're, they're in that region or in that uh, county or whatever you got here, and you need somebody to edify them and encourage them and exhort them to continue in the ways of the Lord. I forget how it's uh, worded there. Oh, he exhorted them all that they, with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. He urged them to continue on in the things of the Lord. It's great getting people saved. It is great. But at the same time, once somebody's saved, God realizes it. And luckily, obviously, it, uh, it's great that the, the church of that time realized it from Jerusalem, that they're going to send, send them to these people, Barnabas, because we need somebody to encourage these newly born Christians to continue on in the ways of the Lord, not just be happy with saved, sanctified, and set for heaven, but to continue on in, in obedience and uh, encouragement and, and growing in the things of the Lord. That, that's what I'm getting out of this. Back to you. Hmm. Well, I'm uh, I'm a little bit confused in that uh, I, I'm not getting any indication of why Barnabas was sent there. Um, let me read it again with, starting with verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, so the church in Jerusalem uh, heard about what we've just been discussing, this Peter's recount of uh, Cornelius and the Gentiles. And, and, and so they, they, in the church in Jerusalem now became aware of this, and they sent forth Barnabas. So this is all part of that one thought. As a result of this, they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. But it doesn't say the reason, uh, and I wish I knew. Uh, verse 23, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, uh, was glad and exhorted them all. So in Antioch, uh, he's, he's, uh, 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 he's already seen the grace of God. Now here's another term that is uh, unfortunately stolen and, and uh, um, let's say uh, hijacked by the, the group that we've I've referenced many times on the Paul Onlyus. They think that the, as a matter of fact, they refer to it as the gospel of the grace of God. Um, and we've mentioned earlier that uh, from the beginning of the Bible through the end, uh, salvation always comes only because of the grace of God. That we're not in a period of history that's temporary. It, it, ha it started with Paul and it'll end at the rapture. And that's the that's the, the, the great age of grace. There's all of the history of man. God is we've been in the age of grace because no salvation can't come except through God's grace, and it's never been by works. Uh, so, but here we have this term that they they like to use to and credit only to Paul in his ministry. And it says he had seen the grace of God. Now. They could say maybe they'll say, well, the grace of God. That that's not that's a different thing. That that's a typical kind of answer that, that I would get from them. That that's not talking about the grace of God for salvation. That's different than Paul's gospel, the grace of God. You know, 
but it seems to me uh, uh, that's a appropriate. He's what he's seeing is these people are getting saved, and he, it's based on the grace of God. Um, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord, um, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and faith, and much people, uh, and much people were added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Um, now, I don't know if this was Barnabas taking initiative or if this was part of his marching orders from Jerusalem. They sent him to, uh, 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 let me see, they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So the church sent him as far as Antioch. It seems to me that the church didn't send him any farther as far as Antioch, but he decided to go farther, I guess. I guess Tarsus would be farther, and he decided to go to Tarsus for, to see Saul. And he's still referred to as Saul here. That's interesting. Um, all right, before I read the next portion here, anything else anybody wants to say? Well, I, 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 go ahead, Ted. No, I didn't have anything. That wasn't me. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, what just occurred to me, Luke, uh, is, yeah, I, you know, I, I always call myself a dispensationalist, but just chewing on, on what you were just saying, you know, you've said it before, but it's kind of sinking in a little bit better for me here. You know, this is not so much about, this is more about revelation and less about dispensation. I, I think you're right. I think it's always been the grace of God. And and rather than being uh, uh, a dispensationalist, I think we'd be better to call ourselves revelationists because uh, God revealed a mystery that, that we didn't see prior to this or that the church or the, the state of Israel, whatever you want to look at it, didn't see clearly. And so rather than anything changing, it was more of was revealed. And so uh, rather than being a dispensationalist, I think we should say that we're revelationists because the mystery that, that wasn't seen was revealed uh, here in the New Testament after Christ. So uh, that makes a lot of sense to me anyway. All right. Yeah, I agree with that. That's, uh, let me read the next portion here. It says verse 26. And when he had found him, this is Barnabas found Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the earth, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Uh, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which were in Judea, which also they did, and, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And that's the end of this chapter here. Um, when I turn this over to you, uh, I'm going to leave the room for a few minutes. Uh, so you guys discuss this. I'm going to get back as quickly as I can, okay? Okay. Uh, you know, the, what comes to mind is, is Claudius has now entered the scene. And if we go, you know, we want to keep in touch with, with the rest of the world here. And, and uh, I think Caligula was the one who was uh, really, really uh, scary to the Jewish people. And Claudius uh, is a guy who, who kind of left the Jews alone, I think. Uh, and in his passing uh, is when the persecution came back with a vengeance. So just looking at the world around the Jews, and I'd have to double check this, but I think Caligula was a, a, a fearsome uh, emperor that, that they were subjugated under. And I think Claudius uh, was not such a such a uh, scary figure, but Claudius doesn't last that long, and 
and uh, I guess it's Julius that comes up next. I, I, I forget. But uh, whoever the next Caesar is brings in the reign of terror uh, to the Jews, I think. So uh, I, I'm not certain on that history, but I think that's how it goes. I, I may have to look that up unless you know, Ted. No, I don't know the, the order of those uh, of those Roman leaders. Uh, brother, were you through with your thought, or do you want me to uh, take up from there? Well, my thought is is it, it it's gonna uh, it's gonna affect how the gospel is spread. Uh, I know that just reading from uh, an article that that uh, that I was attracted to earlier uh, that that uh, the leadership in the Jewish uh, synagogues were very uptight about persecuting the church because uh, they were afraid of offending uh, 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 Caligula. Caesar, and so uh, they were. That's why there was a period of peace uh, to the church from the synagogue, but there was greater fear from the Roman government. And now Claudius comes to power, and it's mentioned in Scripture, so it's it's significant. And uh, I do believe Claudius was a time where the Jewish uh, synagogues, the the, Ju the Jewish uh, leadership was not so afraid to persecute the church. Uh, and then after Claudius passes, uh, then the time of true uh, horror starts for the, uh, the Christians in the Roman Empire. So I, I don't know why that popped into my mind, but I, just, I think it's significant because Claudius is mentioned within Scripture. Well... Amen, brother. I'm, I'm glad you, you've studied that. I, I would like to delve a little bit further into that. Uh, there are some things that jumped out to me. The fact that Barnabas, uh, you know, went looking for Saul. Uh, we don't have any word that, uh, you know, from the, the, of course, from the leadership of Jerusalem that they would say, oh, yeah, and while you're there, seek Saul. You know, we don't, I don't see any indication of that. But he did find him, didn't even... I maybe didn't know where to look for him at first, but when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled with the believers there. And the fact that, uh, you know, they stayed there a whole year and basically had, looks like they had church for a year. Uh, they, they assembled themselves together with the church. Uh, they taught much people. Obviously, there were some, some seekers, you know, some curiosity seekers. And the disciples first called Christians at Antioch. I, I heard something just recently, and I've heard it before, that Christians, uh, this, this, this was a derisive term at first. This is a derogatory term used by the Romans against the Christians, and they, it was like calling them little Christ, you know, and uh, no one that, that followed in the steps of Christ, little Christ. Uh, and they didn't mean it complimentary like we would have nowadays or identification. Uh, and in those days, prophets came from Jerusalem uh, to Antioch, and there stood one of them named Agabus, and uh, basically prophesied, signified by the Spirit, that there should be a great uh, famine, great lack of food in the land. Uh, so this is this is another indication, brothers, that uh, we have the Bible, and especially Luke, uh, being a great historian in his gospel, and the writer of the book of Acts, uh, puts in these historical details that... Uh, a lot of times historians wouldn't even know without the New Testament manuscripts affirming that these things happen and they find later, oh yeah, well the Bible writers were correct. <laughs> it takes usually uh, historians and scientists about you know several decades or centuries to catch up with the Bible. But I think it's significant that, that he puts this in there and that this great famine was going to happen throughout all the known world. And th those things came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar, Claudius who you mentioned, Joe, earlier. And then, so what did they do? What had happened? The disciples, being being charitable, uh, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Judea is a big land. That's a that's a that's an, a big region there. Uh, it's not like Asia Minor or something, but it is it is part of the Middle East over there that was significant in in famine, obviously at that point, or needed it a great lack of food, uh, which also they did, obviously willingly and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And we can bet that uh, Barnabas and Saul had some companions 
to guard them in their travels. So it wasn't just two guys against the world, you know, to fall among thieves and robbers, as Jesus said. You know? So uh, I bet they had, it was more than just those two, although those are certainly the prominent ones uh, mentioned throughout the rest of Acts here. So uh, back to you, brother. Yeah, I, I think I think that's significant. I, you know, uh, I just it, it just occurred to me. Julius was the time of Christ. Caligula was directly after. Now we're at Claudius at the, this time of the church. And you said something that sparked my memory. When they started calling us Christians, is when the persecution really began, and that was under Nero. So Nero was the next Caesar, and he's the one that. Uh, uh, started blaming the Jews for everything and bringing them into the Colosseums for sport, and uh, you know, burned down, famously burned down part of Rome and blamed it on the Christians. And so, uh, yeah, th that's when uh, they started making the fish signs in the sand to identify each other without saying anything, just in case uh, uh, they were rounding up Christians again. So this is the world around it. The world around them right now is quite unstable. And, uh, man, keeping that in mind, we have no idea what it's like to be a Christian uh, back in those days. Uh, so uh, brave brothers back then. That's my only thoughts. Back to you. Well, um, I was gone for a couple of minutes, so I'm not sure if you covered something that I, uh, I wanted to ask. Um, I... I don't see any indication that these this church in Antioch is made up of Gentile believers yet. There's nothing telling me that this message that Gentiles are included that made it up there. It seems to me Barnabas is um, uh, Barnabas is in uh, Jerusalem. He gets the news. He's sent to to Antioch, uh, and then he goes up and gets tar Saul and brings from Tarsus and brings him to Antioch, uh, but the church, let me see if I can get the, the get it in order here, um, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, uh, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Um, now, it doesn't say anything. I, I, I guess we can assume that because Barnabas was in Jerusalem and news about Peter and Cornelius had come into Jerusalem, and then immediately they sent Barnabas to Antioch, uh, I, I think we could probably assume that uh, um, uh, Barnabas uh, passed this information on to Antioch. Um, it doesn't state it, but I'm just trying to piece it together, and I think it's logical that why wouldn't he um, tell them the news that hey, the Gentiles in in uh, uh, the, the Peter preached to Gentiles. Now Gentiles are, are part of this too, and uh, they start preaching to Gentiles up in Antioch. So I, I, it just seems to me that there should be Gentiles there, I guess. Um, now regarding your here's a footnote. Um, uh, Brother Joe, this, this is what you're referring to. Is, it says, Claudius Caesar was the fourth Roman Empire, AD 41 to 54, and he, and he came to the throne after the assassination of his nephew Caligula. Uh, he was succeeded uh, by his adopted son Nero. Uh, so 41 to 54 was Caesar. Uh, and Caligula was before him. And then after this, Claudius Caesar, uh, Nero took over in 54, 54 AD. Now, I've, these timelines I've been referencing here, this timeline is telling us that uh, this Acts 11 happened uh, roughly 41, 41, uh, around between 40 and 41 AD. Uh, so, Actually, this is based upon uh, this is based upon the three years um, that we talked about. That is, they argue about the calendar. Uh, this timeline is is based on uh, uh, 30 A.D. 
being Pentecost rather than 33 AD. So according to our timeline, let's say that instead of 41, this would be around 44 AD. But the, it's imp, I guess it's important to understand that Paul, uh, he got saved, uh, in, according to our calendar, about 36 AD and, and he had 14 years. He says, in, in I looked this up yesterday to find out where I, this 14 years was. It's in, in Galatians chapter 2. He said, talks about this 14-year period where he, where he was, uh, where he was, and uh, so between 36 A.D. and 50 A.D. is that 14-year period, uh, and then after 50 A.D. is when he starts what they call refer to as his first missionary um, um, trip. Um, so I don't know if that helps you regarding the the timeline and these uh, and the the emperors, but uh, that's. You want to say anything more about all that? Uh, just that I, I mentioned it because Claudius was specifically mentioned in Scripture, and I was trying to reconstruct the, the, the timelines and the dispositions of the Caesars as it would have affected the church at that time. And I remember Caligula was quite nuts uh, about getting his uh, statue put into the Jewish temple, and they held him off until after he passed away. And Claudius was not so hostile towards uh, Jews or, or Christians, if my memory serves me. But when Nero comes into power, that's when all hell breaks loose. And there's quite a contingent of Christians that are non-Jews at that time, because all through Rome, he rounds up Christians for the Colosseums, for the you know amusement of the Roman people, uh, to see them die. And so all of this would affect the thoughts and, and attitudes of the believers at the time. So, because Claudius was mentioned, I was just reconstructing. Okay, what is, uh, I, I'd like to get each of your opinion on what, I, what I'm what i speculating about the church in Antioch being uh, Gentile and Jew because because uh, Barnabas, he must have shared the, the, the message about Peter and Cornelius when he went up to Antioch. Do you, do you think that's correct? Well, I'm going to say that it's certainly possible. It's certainly possible, but considering the, the converts that were up back in verse 19 uh, and 20, uh, I think it's going to be primarily, at the very least, uh, Jews. Maybe not, maybe not entirely, but primarily, I think it's going to be majority Jews. Uh, but the time period between 19 and uh, 26, we don't know. Now, obviously, he reiterated or recounted the story of Gentiles being included, and certainly some of them could have and would have been saved during that time, but I still think it's going to be primarily a Jewish uh, group of believers there that they call themselves, you know, the church. Who knows where they did it? Well, I was, what I was referencing is, is that... Um, um, before Barnabas went up there, uh, I would assume that there's no Gentile believers unless Paul was pre preaching to Gentiles at that time, and we have no indication of that. So if that if that's if Paul didn't do it, then it has to be um, Jewish believers until Barnabas gets there. So, but once Barnabas gets there and says um, they were there, they were there for a whole year. So during that year. Um, uh, that that year that Barnabas and Saul um, Saul were in there together, Barnabas must have told Saul uh, and and must have told the, the church in Antioch about Peter and Cornelius. So I would say that year at least they must have started bringing in Gentile believers. Uh, based basically on, on uh, what Ted was saying, I think I think Ted. Uh, is correct. I, I mean, based scripturally speaking, you know, we just don't know, but I lean towards uh, that opinion. But I, I do have memory that Antioch uh, is uh, the first mixed congregation. Uh, a lot of, I, I don't know where I've read that, but it, it does come to mind, you know, there's a lot of Antioch Baptist Church, I think it was an entire denomination at one point. And uh, so uh, I think that is the first mixed recognized congregation 
but at what well, point what that happens. What I'm suggesting is that uh, we could probably we should probably assume that there are no Gentiles in that church in Antioch yet until Barnabas gets there. But once Barnabas gets there, why would Barnabas keep it secret? What happened with, with Peter and Cornelius? And, and once the secret's out, I, I, I think that Gentiles would be joining that church too. Okay. okay. Uh, so let me see. It's 4 o'clock almost. Uh, Ted says he has on his schedule, he, we have to limit this to 90 minutes. So we better, it's a good time. The chapter is over. Let me get each of you to uh, summarize the study. And then I'll, I'll give a brief gospel message. Uh, my 30-second my summary is uh, we're, we're a part of history where uh, the, the church is, is going from Jew only to a, a Gentile mix. And, uh, and so we're going to deal with the problems that that brings up. We've got to remember that the, the Jewish church is not the Pharisees. It's not the, not the temple. This is believers and people who love each other a great deal and the spirit is present. So uh, we'll have conflict in that vein. That's it. Yeah, good word, brother. I, I think this is a this is a turning point. Obviously, this is the big, big transition. Obviously, Peter's defense was received by the uh, the, the, the brethren up in Jerusalem, and uh, we talked about how that Peter's message to Cornelius, his household, his relatives, and in front of them all, there was. A message of salvation it wasn't, you know, uh, a kingdom message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, uh, or in, I mean, you know, that's included maybe in all that. But it, Peter's simple message was, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved." And uh, you know, he was saying this right off. And uh, then these regions, as far as Antioch, we had people getting saved. And obviously, I believe, I believe that uh, even though the church was probably primarily Jewish at Antioch. Barnabas had to be spreading the word, and uh, and you know Paul was not going to be quiet about the gospel. So obviously some Gentiles were getting in, and this is a good thing. It's not a good thing in the eyes of the religious leaders, as we find out, but it's certainly a good thing that uh, Jews and Gentiles in one body uh, equal in the eyes of God. Back to you, brother. Yeah, well, I, I would summarize that one, uh, Peter's message to Cornelius and his family was the same message that Paul teaches. Um, uh, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, remission of sins through faith in Jesus, salvation through faith in Jesus, and, and what he's done for us. Uh, that was the message G Peter preached at Pentecost in every one of his sermons that is so far in Acts, and that's what he preached to Cornelius, and uh, so it's the same gospel message. Uh, now, this, when word gets back and Peter gives his explanation, they immediately are happy and accept it. They're, oh, that's wonderful. Oh, <laughs> you know, that kind of is a surprise. But the idea that the Gentiles are going to be included, okay, uh, they accept it. Uh, and, and we haven't got to James yet, and because this argument is, argument is going to continue. How do we incorporate Gentiles? How do, what does that mean? Uh, well, they're not going to. They're going to take a while to work that out. But the argument that will persist much longer is: What about Judaism? What about circumcision? What about the following the Mosaic laws? What about temple worship? These things they don't want to give up, and uh, that's that's why, where the argument continues for a long time. And you can see this disagreement. Uh, and Paul is the one that is primarily defending or, or articulating that you got to leave. Judaism behind, not only circumcision, but the dietary laws, the Mosaic laws, and especially, I believe he wrote um, Hebrews, he, animal sacrifices, temple worship, that has that can't be here. He's already d died for our sins, one sacrifice for all time, you can't continue doing animal sacrifices. So uh, the Jews, they wanted to, first they wanted to impose that on the Gentile, new believers, and then they agreed to to a compromise, not the Gentiles don't have to do it, but the Jewish believers, you better keep practicing Judaism. And then finally, uh, the argument is, well, is, is, wait, you have to decide, are you a Jew or are you a Christian? If you're, if you're a believer in Jesus, you can't consider, continue with your Judaism. That's, that's going to take a while to work all that out. 
Uh, all right. Now, the, the, the gospel message is, uh, doesn't take long. It's just a very simple message uh, that uh, if you want to go to heaven, you put your faith in Jesus. That's what that's what uh, Peter said. Is remission of sins. Your sins are paid for, and you get to go to heaven simply because of your faith in Jesus. He he died for our sins, so the sin issue is resolved. Thank you, Jesus. And then he would, raised himself from the dead bodily, and that was the proof that he offers us that he is God. He is the Savior and that he alone does have power over life and death, and he promises you if you'll put your faith in him right now, completely, reject any other way of getting to heaven. Reject all the religious rules and regulations, and instead rely completely on Jesus. And if you do that, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because Jesus is your Savior. So I hope you do that now. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll... We'll try to do this uh, daily around 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.